Aloha, half a day. Thank you everyone for coming to tonight's event. Uh, thank you so much to Roger and all the folks at the Hawaii Book and Music Festival and the University of Hawaii uh, for sponsoring uh, today's event. Uh, my name is Craig. I'm going to be a host for, for tonight's reading. And I'm so excited to share that instead of a solo event, this is going to be a dual poetry reading. I'll be introducing uh, my fellow poet, Ariel, and she will read her own original work for about 20 minutes. And then she'll pass the mic to, read, to me and I'll read from my uh, new book, Habitat Threshold, for again, about 20 minutes. And we'll be done in time for dinner. Extra credit for all of you who are, are making spam for tonight's dinner. Uh, save some for me, okay? Just kidding. All right, so our first poet today is the one and only Ariel Taitano Lo, who's a Chamorro poet and literary scholar from the island of Guam. She's currently a PhD student in the English department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Her poetry and creative nonfiction essays can be found in Storyboard, a journal of Pacific imagery, and the indigenous literatures from Micronesia Anthology. She's one of my favorite young poets of the Pacific, and I'm so excited to hear her read. Uh, please, wherever you are zooming in from, let's give her a nice big round of applause. Woohoo! It's Craig for that introduction. Uh, it just so happens that someone cooked spam for me today by happenstance. So that passes the vibe check for today. Um, I'm really excited to share some poetry tonight. I'll be sharing some works in progress some poems that have been previously published, but that all touch on this theme of habitat threshold, um, or this idea of just thinking about what is, what's precious to us ecologically, um, ancestrally. And so to sort of start off my reading, I wanna begin with a poem that I have just written within the past year, which is about um, the ocean where I grew up, which is also pictured in my background here, um, it's known as Apra Harbor. Its indigenous name is Apapa. And so I will go ahead and I'll see if I can share screen. Okay, uh, this, okay, I can't share screen. I'll go ahead and I'll just read it off. Um, oh. I think you can do it now. Okay, I can share screen now. All right. Um, it's okay. I think I'll just read it because I think I have to go into my settings. Sorry about that. Okay. So this poem is entitled Ocean Mapping a Papa. Puhagam Iguaisi Ginani Tasi Giza a Papa. I bear myself to the shore of a papa, folds of my feet in the coral-born sand, ocean, water, reverberating. Deepest resonance binding me to shoreline, waves seeping into both sand and skin, palms open facing the sea. I pull, ocean breathes into my lungs as ancestral breath. Guaisi, the wind, gently tosses and combs through my hair, an ocean mother's fingers. Guahan, inward curvature, limestone waste, extend once again, outward curve to form nestled bay. West side, crescent coral habitat, rich fishing grounds, mamulan, barracuda, in Botsugui, coral homes to schools of palaxi of every color swimming in spirals. Hagen surface and flying fish glide across choppy sapphire blue white speckled waves and swells. The top left crescent peak curves Lagu into Philippine Sea, an upper torso of a papa, Luminao its name, a reef converted into famous glass breakwater, boulders piled up into a great sea wall. I never questioned why the boulders were there. Feet 
in the sands of Luminal Reef. Smooth pieces of shell fizzle upon a bubbling spring. Gwaifi, the wind, brushes across the bridge of my nose, around my cheeks, into the strands of my hair, Gitaksuk Unai, the place where the waves tumble and suck up the sand upon an ever-shifting harbor tide. Aroti Point, protruding bottom curve of the Crescent Moon Bay near Sumai Village, ancestral land. Apra, corruption of the Chamorro word, a papa, which means low. Apra Harbor is a very small port in Guam. See below for live maps of ship positions, schedules for vessels, port calls. Dad says, nothing is there anymore. Craters dredged into an Apapa moon. When a reef is dredged, do you know what's left of it? Nothing. Down into the water, carved straight into the reef, slicing through. No more fish. Used to catch skipjack in 10 minutes. Now underwater detonations, bombs go off ground shakes, water shoots up into the sky. A diver sent to make sure no turtles are in the vicinity. Stay 300 feet away from the area. Boats chase away commercial watercraft on testing days. Cleanup crew picks up dead fish out of the water. The island is about 36 miles long, six to 12 miles wide, and in many ways, Guam is an all-American community. Nuclear submarine, radiation leak minimal, birth defects, cancer. Maybe it came from the harbor. No one ever cared to find out. That's really interesting that you suggest swimming at the port. Don't usually think of a place like that as a place for recreational swimming, you know? With all the gasoline and chemical leaks from ships, we really did just live and swim and fish in a place that fed us for generations. A multi-ethnic mix offers a microcosm, Guam's own rich Chamorro culture and heritage draws visitors from Japan, other Asian countries, and Europe. Itasi Giza Apapa Hapulensu, the ocean at Apapa, she raised me. Since five years old, napping in coral born sand, ocean water reverberating, rocking me against a tide pool cradle, the sound, a swish song lullaby. Thank you. So that is my first poem for tonight's reading, Ocean Mapping of Papa. And so this next poem that I'm going to read is another poem that I had written this past year. It's published in Humanities Guahan, um, online magazine Unincorporated. And so the title of this next poem is One Day Our Bodies Will Truly Be Free. And so this poem I had written in response to the clearing of hundreds of acres of pristine limestone forest for the creation of a live fire shooting range above Latexen, also known as Rutidian Wildlife Refuge in Guahan, which is home to thousand year old Chamorro villages, which houses artifacts, um, endangered species, and that part of this clearing in preparation for the military buildup has included the excavation of ancestral bones. Um, and so this poem was written in response to that. One day our bodies will truly be free. Pagahu, your island, 
Kwadahu, your body is an island. Trace its belonging in this archipelago, Guahan. Southernmost of 15 sisters, Laguas Sangani, your grandmothers and great grandmothers and great great grandmothers' homes. Itanota Itataotaumu, the land is your body. Itasi Ihagamu, the ocean is in your blood. The airi not mongmong ikurasonmu, the air beats life into your heart. Plus natungo esti hagahu, so know this, that when they come for your body, extract limestone forest, like harvesting organs, pour toxins into our ocean like poison into your bloodstream, carve out lifeblood coral gardens like a uterine invasion until all that is left is your bones. I will stand here resisting so that there will always be an abundance of kana for you to inherit. Sumai, Apapa, Pagan, the Texan, they'll never take away your genealogy. They'll never take away your name. An archipelago of ocean, 15 sisters reunited, Italtaltanu, sovereign. Our island is your body. It will be your daughter's body and your daughter's daughter's body. One day, our bodies will truly be free. Thank you. So this next poem that I'm going to share with you all is another ode to the ocean. I come from an ocean family of fishermen and fisherwomen, farmers, grandmothers, grandfathers, cousins, extended family. And so this poem I wrote in 2015, after my papa took me to go fishing at Ipau Reef um, so that I could help uh, raise money to pay for my college tuition. Uh, he said, nothing's for free, so you have to come help me catch fish to go sell. Um, so this poem is called Taladzeru. I saw the sun rise over the ocean, my first time standing on the reef with my papa. My feet upon sand, rock, urchins tucked between crab holes, panglao pockets at low tide. Ipao, the smell of seaweed and sea salt, shore to my back and barrels of ocean chasing the sky before me. A quarter mile closer to the horizon, I watched him watch the waves, his guagua hugging his waist as tightly as a child and the surf up to our knees, fighting to make us bend in reverence to the Tautamotna in our waters. The currents could have pulled us until our knees kissed coral, but he taught me how to respect the ocean, how to stand firmly when the surf is rising as quickly as the sun. And I heard raindrops on the water with no cloud in the sky, a downpour of lead pattering into the ocean, a ring of woven nets promising the ocean it will be faithful. His arms painted brown from sunlight, strong arms pulling the taladza full of kitsu and sedzun, teaching me to pick them from the nets to avoid a painful sting from their spines. We went home that day with his guagua half full, where grandma would be waiting for us. And so that was Taladzeru dedicated to my papa, Johnny Atulai Taitano. Um, so this last poem that I'm going to share with you all today, it's a poem that I started writing in 2014. It was at the beginning of my Chamorro language journey. And, you know, to be, to be fair, 
Chamorro language journey for me ha has started since I was born with my parents using as many words as possible. Um, but this poem marks a really important time in my adult life where I chose to seek out as much knowledge as possible to, to really learn the language. And so um, I'm happy to share this piece as an embodiment. Um, so across all the poems I'm sharing with you tonight is this idea of, of healing and the different ways that can be done through writing and through the process of re-embodiment, um, basically picking up where our ancestors left off and being ourselves. Um, so without further intro, here's the last poem for my reading for today, which is entitled Trunka Nunu. And so Trunka Nunu is the native Chamorro word for banyan tree. Sinanahu biha ti comprendi bu, and I kumakwinta skisino English. If I speak in English, my great grandmother can't understand what I'm saying. Her native language, my native language, is rooted in this land just like the banyan trees. Itrunkan Nunu connects us to our ancestors, Itautamotna, the first Chamorro people. And through invasion, after invasion, conquered by Spain, captured by America, occupied by Japan, waves of genocide, colonization, and imperialist policies have tried to cut out our native tongues and uproot our ancestry. Spanish and Japanese invasion couldn't eradicate our bird song. But today, back in US hands, reoccupied by America since 1944 in my generation, we are told as often as the ring of school bells that Isinota, our Chamorro language, is disappearing, dying, like the absence of birdsong in our trees, decaying like a trunk of nunu slowly rotting with disease. On our island, English was forced upon my grandparents. My grandma tells me how she was punished for speaking Chamorro in elementary school. I wonder if she knew that an English only policy would spread from the school hallways into the school bus, into our home. In my family, I come from a second generation of Chamorros whose first and often only language is English. In just two generations, our island let this species take hold, wake up. English may be beautiful in its own right, but it isn't native to this land. I've been pushing through the leaves of books and digging through the roots of my family, trying to nurture a language my grandmothers couldn't pass down to me, and my roots have led me to them. My grandmothers taught me what good soil looks like, that learning Chamorro is as easy as asking them questions. I can't deny that language revitalization lies on my tongue. Buds of banyan flowers waiting to bloom as red as my grandmother's achotzi stained hands, send guest pugli sinota. Our language is so beautiful. My generation may not be flourishing with fluent speakers, but like my grandmother's say, we are made of good soil. Tisina fomino do perfectu lo bai cada dia para ilinat lahu. I may not speak perfectly, but I will practice each day and pass down what I can. Dumotu kui sinidza gipitoku. The seed in my chest is growing with the strength of my ancestors. Dumotu kui hal gisinidza. And I come when to soak gisino samoro root. Birth from this seed with every tomorrow word I speak. The branches are growing inside my limbs. The banyan roots are spreading through my body. The strongest banyan roots can crack colonial cement. This colonial foundation will crumble as the roots of our ancestors rise. 
Sidros Maasi. That concludes my poetry reading for today. Yes, that was amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Ariel, for that beautiful reading. I feel very, very emotional right now, as I'm sure other people are. Uh, thank you for, for sharing those just so powerful and moving poems about your homeland, your culture, your family, just beautiful articulations of, of exactly the, the theme of this event today, thinking about our habitats that we live in, the connection to our bodies, um, to our cultures, and really thinking about how they are under threat from various forces of colonialism and, and militarism and how we have to rise up uh, against those forces. So beautiful. Thank you everyone for, for leaving comments in the chat. If you haven't already, please drop a line, let Ariel know um, how you feel about her poems, any lines that jumped out at you. That was amazing. Mahalo, Situs Mahasi, Ariel. All right, so uh, many of the poems I'm gonna share today actually take place here in Hawaii. So you'll kind of get a nice Western Pacific, uh, Central Pacific uh, connections here. Um, my book that uh, this, this event was themed after is, is titled Habitat Threshold. And I just wanted to uh, share the cover with you here. Uh, it was published in 2020. You'll see uh, in the middle panel of the front cover is actually a, a picture of my father uh, holding my, my first daughter when she was about, I don't know, six, nine months old, uh, first time meeting the ocean. And so kind of introducing her to, to Mother Ocean, uh, Moana Nui. And uh, that is juxtaposed with two pictures. Uh, one, the top is of melting glaciers from the Arctic. And the very bottom picture is uh, smoke and wildfires in California, which is where uh, my parents now live. And you can see the back cover uh, behind those blurbs is an actual picture of a plastic debris that's been collected and washed up upon the shores here in Hawaii and of course across the Pacific. And so this book um, you know, kind of wrestles with a lot of these environmental themes and what it's like for me to, to be a, a new parent uh, in a time of, of climate change and, and environmental injustice. And so I'm just gonna share a few poems with you today, uh, but before I get started, I, I did want to dedicate uh, the reading to my amazing wife, uh, Brandy Nolani McDougall, who I love with, with all of my heart and so grateful for her to um, be a, a co-parent with me as we you know, think about the world that we want our, our daughters to inherit. And, and she does make an appearance in, in many of these poems, as does my daughter. Okay, I'll stop sharing here. All right, so the first poem from the book is called Age of Plastic. The doctor presses the plastic probe against my pregnant wife's belly. Plastic leeches estrogenic and toxic chemicals. Ultrasound waves pulse between plastic, tissue, fluid, and bone until the embryo echoes. Plastic makes this possible. My wife labors at home in an inflatable plastic tub. Plastic disrupts hormonal and endocrine systems. After delivery, she stores her placenta in a plastic freezer bag. Plastic is the perfect creation because it never dies. Our daughter sucks on a plastic pacifier. Whales, plankton, shrimp, and birds confuse plastic for food. The plastic pump whirls, breast milk drips into a plastic bottle. Plastic keeps food, water, and medicine fresh yet how empty plastic must feel to be birthed, used, then disposed by us degrading creators. In the oceans, one ton of plastic exists for every three tons of fish, how free plastic must feel when it finally arrives to the paradise of the Pacific gyre, will plastic make life impossible? Our daughter falls asleep in a plastic crib and I dream that she's composed of plastic so that she too will survive 
our wasteful hands. Okay, this next poem uh, takes us to the Waikiki Aquarium, which was one of my, my daughter's favorite places uh, before the pandemic. Uh, this poem is called A Sonnet at the Edge of the Reef. We dip our hands into the outdoor reef exhibit and touch sea cucumber and red urchin as butterfly fish swim by. A docent explains, once a year after the full moon, when tides swell to a certain height and salt water reaches the perfect temperature. Only then will the ocean cue coral polyps to spawn in synchrony, a galaxy of gametes, which dances to the surface, fertilizes, opens, forms larvae, roots to seafloor, and grows generation upon generation. At home, we read a children's book, the Great Barrier Reef, to our daughter snuggling between us in bed. We don't mention corals bleaching, reared in labs or frozen. And isn't our silence too a kind of shelter? So if you've never seen a coral, coral spawning, I definitely recommend uh, maybe go on YouTube and, and watch a video. It's, it's absolutely amazing and, and wondrous. Okay, this next poem is called Care. And I actually wrote it a few years ago for World Refugee Day. And it was for an event here in Hawaii that some poets organized to raise awareness about the Syrian refugee crisis. And even though, like I said, that was a few years ago, I wanted to share it today given um, just the, the constant refugee crises around the world from Afghanistan to the US-Mexico border. It's called Care. Our daughter wakes from her nap and cries. I pick her up, press her against my chest and whisper, daddy's here, daddy's here. Here is the island of Oahu, 8,500 miles from Syria. But what if Pacific trade winds suddenly became flames and shrapnel indiscriminately barreling towards us? What if shadows cast upon our windows aren't plumeria tree branches, but soldiers and terrorists marching? Daddy's here, daddy's here, I whisper. Would we reach the Mediterranean in time? Am I strong enough to straighten my legs into a mast balanced with the pool and drifts of the currents? Am I brave enough to bear her across the razor wires of foreign countries and racial hatred? Could I plead, please help us? Please just let us pass. Please, we aren't suicide bombs. Could I keep walking if my feet crack like halabi pepper fields after five years of drought, after this drought of humanity. Daddy's here, daddy's here. Trains and buses rock back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to detention centers. But what if our desperate boat capsizes? Could I inflate my body into a buoy to hold her above rough waves. Daddy's here, daddy. Will drowning be the last lullaby of the sea? Or will we carry each other towards the horizon of care? This next poem is, is called Blood Ivory. Um, and it takes us to another one of my daughter's favorite places, the Honolulu Zoo. And um, I wrote this poem for uh, World Elephants Day. When we reach the elephant enclosure, I lift our daughter up 
so she can see them playing in shallow ponds. Look, I say, they love the water, just like you. Today, 96 elephants are being massacred across Africa's scarred savanna. Armed poachers surround the herds who stomp, trumpet, and encircle their calves. Bullets, those small human tusks, bite through thick, wrinkled skin. Do the men still feel awe or majesty, or do they only feel their own awful poverty as they sever the incisors once used to split bark and forage? Warlords will sell this white gold to be carved into jewelry, relics, and art, then smuggled across the planet, our man-made elephant graveyard. This year, 35,000 will be slain. Our daughter waves goodbye to them as we walk towards the exit. Do we build zoos to save what we've sacrificed, to display what we dominate? or to cage our own wild urge to kill every breathing being. Our daughter plays with a stuffed elephant doll in the gift shop. Look, I say, it has ears, eyes, and a mouth, just like you. She touches its tusks, smiles, then touches her own teeth. I just have uh, two more poems to share. Um, there's a whole section of this book that it's all about uh, human and animal relations, um, thinking about, especially about endangered species um, here in the Pacific. And so this next poem uh, is titled The Last Safe Habitat. And it's uh, dedicated to a native Hawaiian bird, uh, the Kauai O'o whose last song was, whose song was last heard here in, in 1987. The last safe habitat. I don't want our daughter to know that Hawaii is the bird extinction capital of the world. I don't want her to walk around the island feeling haunted by tree roots buried under concrete. I don't want her to fear the invasive predators who slither, pounce, bite, swallow, disease, and multiply. I don't want her to see paintings and photographs of birds she'll never witness in the wild. I don't want her to imagine their bones in dark museum drawers. I don't want her to hear their voice recordings on the internet. I don't want her to draw a timeline in school with the years each was first collected and last cited. I don't want her to learn about the Kauai O'o, who was observed atop a flowering ohia tree, calling for a mate day after day, season after season, because he didn't know he was the last of his kind until one day he disappeared forever into a nest of avian silence. I don't want our daughter to calculate how many miles of fencing is needed to protect the endangered birds that remain. I don't want her to realize the most serious causes of extinction can't be fenced out. I want to convince her that extinction is not the end. I want to convince her that extinction is just a migration to the last safe habitat on earth. I want to convince her that our winged relatives have arrived safely to their destination, a wondrous island with a climate we can never change and a rainforest fertile with seeds and song. Okay, for my last poem, uh, I'm gonna see if Ariel is, are you still there? Can you uh, pull yourself back up? 
All right, can you unmute yourself? All right, this is a call and response. This is a call and response phone. I'm kind of surprising her with this. Um, i It's called. <laughs> all right, all right. It's called Chanting the Waters. And it was, again, written several years ago for the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and uh, kind of to raise awareness about what was happening <clears throat> over there in terms of uh, water protection. And so I wrote this poem. And every time I, I say the word say, Ariel's going to say water is life. Okay, and folks at home, you can, you can uh, also do it as well if you like. All right, chanting the waters. Say. Water is life. Because our bodies are 60% water. Because my wife labored for 24 hours through contracting waves. Because water breaks forth from shifting tectonic plates. Say. Water is life. Because amniotic fluid is 90% water. Because she breathed and breathed and breathed because our lungs are 80% water, because our daughter crowned like a new island, say? Water is life. Because we tell creation stories about water, because our language flows from water, because our words are islands writ on water, because it takes more than three gallons of water to make a single sheet of paper, say? Water is life. Because water is the next oil, because 180,000 miles of U.S. oil pipelines leak every day. Because we wage war over gods and water and oil. Say? Water is life. Because our planet is 70% water. Because only 3% of global water is fresh. Because it takes two gallons of water to refine a gallon of gasoline. Because it takes 20 gallons of water to make a pound of plastic. Because the average American water footprint is 2,000 gallons a day. Say? Water is life. Because a billion people lack access to drinking water. Because women and children walk four miles every day to gather clean water and deliver it home. Say? Water is life. Because our bones are 30% water. Because if you lose 5% of your body's water, you become feverish. If you lose 10% of your body's water, you become immobile. Because our bodies won't survive a week without water, say. Water is life. Because corporations privatize, dam, and bottle our waters. Because plantations divert our waters. Because animal slaughterhouses consume our waters. Because pesticides, chemicals, lead, and waste poison our waters, say. Water is life. Because they bring their bulldozers and drills and drones. Because we bring our feathers and lay and sage and shells and canoes and hashtags and totems. Because they call us savage and primitive and riot. Because we bring our treaties and the declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples. Because they bring their banks and politicians and dogs and paychecks and pepper spray and bullets because we bring our songs and schools and prayers and chants and ceremonies, because we say stop, keep the oil in the ground, because they say shut up and vanish, because we are not moving, because they bring their police and private militia, because we bring all our relations and all our generations and all our live streams say. Water is life because our drumming sounds like rain after drought echoing against taut skin, because our skin is 60% water, say. Water is life. Because every year millions of children die from waterborne diseases. Every day thousands of children die from waterborne diseases. By the end of this poem, five children will die from waterborne diseases, say. Water is life. Because our daughter loves playing in the ocean. Because someday she'll ask, where does the ocean end? Because we'll point to the dilating horizon. Say. Water is life. Because our eyes are 95% water. Because we'll tell her ocean has no end. Because sky and clouds lift ocean. Because mountains embrace ocean into blessings of rain. 
because ocean, sky, rain fills aquifers and lakes, because ocean, sky, rain, lake flows into the Missouri River, because ocean, sky, rain, lake, river returns to the Pacific and connects us to our cousins at Standing Rock, because our blood is 90% water, say? Water is life. Because our hearts are 75% water. So I'll teach our daughter our people's word for water, hanum, hanum, hanum. So the sound of water will always carry her home. Say, hanum is life. <laughs> Say, hanum is life. Say, hanum is life. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Ariel. I know you got to go for another event that you have this evening. But let's give Ariel one more round of applause for her just gorgeous, moving, powerful poems. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much again to Roger and everyone at the Hawaii Book and Music Festival to Colin for all, all the tech support. Uh, uh, I'm going to hang around for a few minutes if folks want to chat. Uh, otherwise, I hope everyone has a nice dinner. Uh, take good care of yourself. And hopefully, uh, I'll see you at, as an attendee at, at future uh, book festival events. Sidus Maasi, mahalo. Have a good night. Sidus Maasi. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, that was quite beautiful. Thank you, Roger. Thank you everyone for coming. Thanks for your comments too. I'm just reading them now. So beautiful.